Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. But what does it mean for the language to be pure? Or when people say they want English to be pure, what are they talking about? Is Shakespeare pure? I mean, uh, in fact, uh, every stage of history, language is that there is no such thing as a language. There are lots of things that are speaking that different people have. They will still say, this is the language of the Welcome to episode number two of the Everything Keys, where we are attempting to unravel the mysteries of the original language of the Bible, being Obri, and probably covering a lot of ground in between. Um, Today's episode is going to be covering the the first three sections of the the Olivet book that we talked about on the last episode, the Hebraic Tongue Restored. And I am joined again today and will be for some time by Nathan. How you doing, Nathan? I'm good. Excellent. Uh, so in these first three sections of the book, of course, he's not getting into a lot of technical linguistic meat uh, as far as figuring things out. But what he's doing is, and it's unfortunate in one way, and I guess in another way it's good because there might be a lot of people listening to this that think that some of the uh, assumptions that in this book he's propagating are the actual true narrative of the way things went. Now, my purpose is not to argue what scholars have to say. It's not that I it's not that I entirely disregard what scholars have to say about anything necessarily, but it's because uh my job is to pretty much tell you here's what the Bible says as best as I have come to be able to figure these things out. That's mostly it. Um, I'll oftentimes work from other sources and say, here are these claims or those claims. But the thing is, and this is the whole point, why I stick pretty much with just what the Bible's narrative is. Um, first off, it it is such a gigantic work that, I've found, I've seen far too many scholars, even ones with good intentions, uh, spread themselves really thin. And even with just focusing on uh, language and geography, I feel spread pretty thin. Um, but you know that's why there are so many others that are specializing in in other fields, which is really great. It's just too bad that most of the professional academics out there are or have become whether, you know, an honest academic might actually listen to this at one point in time. Um, The thing is, the majority of them are absolutely untrustworthy. They've given us very untrustworthy narratives over and again. And it's quite clear that some very dishonest people have been controlling the narrative, the way that we see things, perceive the world around us, the way that we assume history went down, and so on and so forth. So that's that. That is my uh, that that that's my goal in all of this. I'm just 
here to say, here's what I know that the Bible says, and here's the way that it varies from what maybe popular opinion or knowledge might be. And, you know, in the meantime, I, I might be able to offer some things uh, besides that. Now, the reading that we agree to do, and by the way, uh, Nathan and I don't confer on, on any of this stuff uh, in between times. We both do the reading, and we're coming at it from, from different angles, and, you know, with, with really our, our own set of um, goals in mind. Uh, and I, I think it just makes it a little bit better that way and a little bit more spontaneous. So the the reading was the introductory dissertation, a Roman numeral one, upon the origin of speech and upon the study of the tongues, which can lead to it. Then Roman numeral two, the Hebraic tongue authenticity of the Sefer of Moses vicissitudes experienced by this book. And then part three is the continuation of the revolutions of the Sefer, origin of the principal versions which have been made. <clears throat> and just keep in mind, every time that uh, D'Olivet, and, and you know what, it is more properly, probably D'Olivet because he's French. It's just that I've heard the name D'Olivet uh in the past anglicized so much that uh, I'm probably going to just keep hitting that as default, but it is properly D'Alevé as he is French. Um, so before we start this, and, and as I said, every time he says Sefer, the Sefer of Moses, he is referring to the first 10 chapters of Genesis. So I, w I guess, unfortunately, he didn't translate more because at the end of this book, he translates those 10 chapters of Genesis, and it is an extremely in-depth translation. The word studies that he does, even though I don't agree with many of his conclusions, nor do I agree with the, the text that he's using as foundational, the, the word studies and his perspective is invaluable. So before uh, we actually start paging through this to get to some of the um, main points in it. Did you have anything that you wanted to, to put in here uh, just before we get rolling, Nathan? Um, first, a technical <clears throat> issue. Am I loud enough? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I went through this. Uh, I gave the first read free of notes and went through a second time and uh, annotated what seemed pressing to me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I come from a completely different school of thought than you do and, and history. And I don't know how much of this you're familiar with as you read. Um, but like I was telling some members of my research group, to the uninitiated or the unfamiliar, you could lose a month just discovering the references that that he's into. And mm -hmm. if you were to read this as if it were an authoritative text, he presses so many ideas into such a dense space yeah. that that if you if you treat it like you don't agree, it, it actually slows down your reading. So I had mm -hmm. to go through things a couple of times just to to dig through many of the claims. Yeah. And, <laughs> and there are a lot. <clears throat> it, there are a lot. There, there are a lot. And it's let's just begin. I'm yeah, I've been excited for this. <laughs> yeah, it's uh okay, so I guess to lay the the groundwork at least for this first section, um, in a nutshell. His foundation is that the Hebrews, I'll use his terminology, the Oberim, the Hebrews, they had a language before they went to Mitzrim, but in his mind, it's Egypt. And it was their time in Egypt, and again, he claims 400 
30 years. Uh, I've disproven that, and you can disprove that there uh, in the Bible, too. I've made some notes on that. But that the language changed, that their actual language changed. And in claiming that, and, and the fact that he, he doesn't see the Bible as divinely inspired, um, what he is claiming is that this language is, is quite simply just the language of man, um, and, and here's the premise that I've gone on for quite some time, is that we're looking at a couple of options, really probably just two main options. This is either a divine language created and preserved over the entire period when the Bible was being written in, which is somewhere just shy of about 1,500 years, which is... Um, an amazing amount of time for a language to remain static. That's one thing that that people would have to appreciate. It, it really is. Not many languages could boast that. It either has to be divine, and if it is, then it has an order and a structure. It has characteristics that are repetitive and coherent. But if it is a language of man, and if it has been altered at two significant points in time, which he covers, once being in Mitzram or Egypt, and the second time being at the time of Ezra. If that were the case, then we've got nothing to go on, and we could just argue <clears throat> for the rest of eternity if we had it. Um, and that's a problem. That's a serious problem. It's the, the, the main crux of the problem that I brought up when I first made the very first videos about this, that it's got to be one or the other. It is either a language that was uh, created by the Almighty, and therefore, at its root, it is a perfect language, and it is knowable, and it is... Um, True, it has facets and characteristics that are repeatable, but if it's from man, then it's not. And, you know, one thing I see that is clear is that Masoretic is from man, but the language below it is not. Now, he's approaching this as in the language is from man, that it has changed uh, quite a lot over the years. I think it's interesting that... Uh, with the mindset that he has and the presuppositions that it would appear that he's bringing to this innocently. Um, I don't know exactly how he had intended on restoring the Hebraic language, but, I mean, that doesn't take away from the value of what we're going to find herein. The first thing that struck me was actually on page five, book number page five, and I did make a mistake last time pointing out the uh, the 18 and 66 because that was actually in the PDF numbering. <laughs> that wasn't in the page numbering. This actually starts on page three. But um, he makes a statement on page five. He says, if the language of man is an agreement, how is this agreement established without language? And that's very similar to what I've said before about language can be seen as a sort of a currency. Um, and yeah, a lot of languages work, and even our language of today, even though there's nothing pure about it, it is a, a, a conglomeration of a lot of different languages, terms from different languages, based on about a quarter percent of Germanic and at the time it was based on that, Germanic probably wasn't a pure language, but it works. The language we're using to communicate, it, it works in the sense that we can probably dive into the, the lexicon that we have concerning English in our head and come up with something through our experience over the years that will relay to one another what it is we mean to relate to one another. So language is kind of a currency 
and anyone can agree on currency. You know, I don't have a problem with fiat currency. The thing about currency being, let's say, a commodity, and that this is why people who are super rich, um, they actually put their wealth into things that are commodities. One of those things uh, would be land investment and then other types of precious commodities that won't lose their value is because food. Yeah, that's a commodity and it's, it's always going to be uh, valuable. Well, language can be like that too. And if you have languages that are inherently valuable, then in a way it doesn't even matter what the agreement is. Um, and it's interesting that he starts out in, in that vein because the agreement really doesn't matter if the language is, as I've stated, what I believe Obrey is, that it is a language that actually has built-in fail-safes so that you really can't screw with the, uh, the value of it, like, say, uh, people can mess with the value of fiat currencies. They can mess with the value of fiat languages, just like they do with English in the realm of education, law, science, and language. Do you have anything else to add to that? That was just the first thing I had, I had highlighted from him. As for the, the claims he makes on page five, language is indeed a currency, but the value of language is the value of shared experience. And this is where we, we talked last time about this, where two best friends or two people that have grown up together have their own language because they draw from their shared experiences mm -hmm. to make references and inferences and to communicate. And so his, I think it's a really good point. Um, what was the original one that he said? Uh, if the language of man is in agreement, how is this agreement established without language? Mm-hmm. Now I think I think this is It a is like a catch thing. 22. <clears throat> it really is because yeah. an agreement builds the language. Yeah. You don't need the language for the agreement. You need the agreement to make the language. I mean, don't you find it ironic that he should say that when he believes that the language has undergone all these changes and he doesn't seem to you know, really believe in the divine character of it. So I think it's it's really odd for him to say something like that, given what seems to be his views so far. No, and and he seems to openly in the first 10 pages cherish the visual and aural aesthetic of various languages and yet treats them in the next sentence or paragraph as mechanistic. And, yeah. and I think there's a, there's a dissociation involved in that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it makes you wonder, you know, some people that have, if they're working off a bad theory, oftentimes they don't even see how it is that they're contradicting themselves. Um, and, and I guess that's what I found so odd about that because it seems that that statement in itself is contradictory to, the whole purpose of what he's doing here it would seem it would seem i mean we'll see we'll see as we go you know maybe that was a bit misunderstood um but it is quite a great statement to make it does have a lot of weight behind it um and i think that it is uh it serves to reinforce um the idea that well, you know, what's the, the basic uh, mainstream narrative on, what, on where language came from? Most of the mainstream narratives is that it developed. Yeah. Right? Based on developed. shared experiences. Yeah. Yeah. I think his statement is clever because it's neutral. You can argue it from either side. Mm -hmm. And he does this so much 
that it, I mean, in my mind, there's no doubt that it was intentional every time. This, uh, he, he's remained cleverly neutral on some of these more nebulous topics. Artful language. Yes. <laughs> the spell. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know, uh, if, if you had anything before this, but, um, I didn't know if you had anything that any impressions that you had concerning his opinions on the languages of Asia, uh, starting at page seven. Of course, the mm -hmm. this was the the first topic that I brought back to some of the core members of my groups. Yeah. Uh, in page ten, the Tatars have no Bible. Has it been gone or has it been subsumed? Mm -hmm. The Chinese and the funny thing here, he he is he's so accurate. I love this. He calls it the E King and then refers to it as the King from then mm -hmm. on. And we say Ching. Mm -hmm. But where does the Ch come from? So every time I read this, I'm reminded that his way is proper. Or the Hindu Vedas, the Hebrew Sefer of Moses, but what of a Tataric Bible? Was there a religious text? Mm -hmm. We're looking at the tail end of a centuries-long genocide of Uyghurs after they have been indoctrinated wholesale into the Muslim faith. These people are now almost gone. Mm -hmm. And this means that they were something before they were made Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if... In not choosing the Uyghuric Tataric languages, mm -hmm. that he he's walking in he's walking into the movie late. Are there other Bibles that we know okay. exist, but we have no no whole copies of? Yes, he actually talks about that when he mentions Zoroaster, mm -hmm. and so that. Should we have enough surviving Zoroastrian text, we might be speaking of that language instead. So I feel like his choice on on the three that he, he wanted to go to was a bit arbitrary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's, um, what is it, the other one? He was talking about... Ah, here we are. Chinese for the eyes and Sanskrit for the ears. And how the Hebrew language is a perfect blend of both. But the reason that he did his book on the Hebraic tongue wasn't because he wanted to. He plainly states that it was the most accessible, but if he'd had time and money... He would have done Chinese, then Sanskrit, and finished with the Hebraic tongue. Mm -hmm. And so boiling down his reasons was, was quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we have this, this idea that um, what Europe was, was made of... Uh, was uh, what five six hundred plus BC was the Greeks, and then a few hundred years later Rome. Both of them actually having a religious system that is just basically full of myth and and fairy tale kind of stories. It's not, you know, there doesn't seem to be any Bible or holy book you know, from those cultures. Yes. Um, I mean, how much about those cultures feels artificial or how much do you think that that is possibly the, uh, the makeup of what we call today the Tartarian Empire? Ooh, as for Greek is, and Roman is that and Etruscan? <clears throat> I yeah, think that is, are, is a far cry from it. I, uh -huh. I've always viewed them as wholly separate. 
when we when we look at <laughs> that's funny when we look at the the Vedas when we look at Greek Etruscan Roman um, archetypes in religions they seem built on parable and this is this is one of the things that lends them to a timelessness when we look at the Abrahamic religion as a whole it it seems built on event and history and yeah. and this is one thing that has lent it such credence over the years mm -hmm. to not be discounted yeah whereas people can say the vedas are just a an early how to book no matter how right or wrong they may be mm -hmm. from that point of view yes as for a tataric bible or a uyghuric bible there's just no trace. Mm -hmm. It's gone. It, it may have become something else, but to be completely honest, I don't think that such a widespread confederacy, <laughs> which is what we, we're believing of the Tatarian idea, such a widespread confederacy would have been the possessor of a single scriptural work. Mm -hmm. I think more like we know the story of Alexander mm -hmm. and how he went about conquering everything and leaving it the way it was. He basically said, keep your rules, keep your laws, keep your gods. And mm -hmm. so the Alexander story just shows that you don't need a single work. Empire, and I've been saying this all week with everyone, empire is an amalgam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of them are. Um, yeah, it, it, an ethno state mm -hmm. is an ethno state is by its very nature limited and small and sometimes localized, mm -hmm. um, but for the size and might that you would need to be classified as an empire, you would need to absorb an amalgamation of everything mm -hmm. around you. Yeah. This could be the resultant mythology and religions that we see of the Greeks and Romans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I went off. On I'm, <laughs> no, that's okay. I was thinking about thinking about what you said for a minute, and and at the same time, uh, looking ahead a little bit, it, it might make uh, what I'm saying a little bit choppy, because I mean, there's probably not time to uh, to go through and and read all of both of our highlights as we go. Um, if I get to a page. And let's say I, uh, I concentrate on something on that page and you had anything before or up to that page that you wanted to, to bring in, uh, please feel free. And, and that's kind of how I'll, I'll work forward, uh, yeah. to try to make this timely. I'm looking at a lot of my notes. A lot of them, I, I don't even know how appropriate they are to, to bring up this early. Um, like you said, he does make a lot of claims. Um, unfortunately, if I were to comment on many of them, it would take us, uh, far abroad of, I think what we want to just accomplish with these chapters, these again, aren't necessarily the meat, uh, the technical meat of what we want to get into, but there are basic assumptions in this. One of the things that also I, I did want to mention, and I am going to ask you if you, if if you do desire to, to say anything concerning Jones, because there, there are some uh, footnote authors and references that I'm sure it's going to be productive to at least comment on. I, I did find myself just reading up on Sir William Jones quickly, but I did want to uh, point out something, <clears throat> and this is just going to be a vein that goes through this. Uh, that I, I, I just have to, to approach, and it is how heavily overshadowed uh, 
well, how heavily Egypt and the concepts of what Egypt was and the linking of Egypt with the Bible, the Mitzrim of the Bible, and all of those assumptions about Egypt, it seems to overshadow the occult. Um, if you just do a search on the occult in Egypt, what you'll find out is that there are um, a lot of writings out there by various people concerning the occult practices of Egypt. And I don't know how many of those are true or not. Um, there are some people that claim that a lot of this is fabricated, that it's unsubstantiated. Um, but there does seem to be a running theme with the occult and Egypt. For some reason, they really love Egypt. And I don't know exactly why that is, if that has a lot to do with the deceptive nature of equating Egypt with Mitzram. Because I can tell everybody definitively out there that the Mitzram of the Bible bears almost no resemblance to the Egypt of Egyptology. Like none. Um, so there seems to be quite a heavy fascination and affinity with Egypt and the occult. I'm not there, saying that that's consciously what the Olivet is doing. There are some there are some really simple questions that arise in the mind when you hear him refer to Egypt, and especially to his blatant claim. Page 16, Hebrew is the tongue of Egypt. Right. Direct claim. And he yeah. goes on, and I'm perfectly comfortable jumping around within the first 30 pages just sure. to, to make points and, yeah. and discuss them. On page 17, he continues, Hebrew usage has been degenerated from, uh, from the right brain to the left brain. Uh, quote, all that was intelligible has become sentient. All that was universal had become particular. So if Hebrew is the tongue of Egypt, and he's writing this at a time when Egyptology is, well, is being founded in the sense that we know it, yeah. then why does, why does he not just say that it's the Egyptian tongue. He mm -hmm. goes on to state later, I mean, and for anybody that's a big fan of Jew bashing, nobody does it like this guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. There's an entire page that he, he goes <clears throat> on to state the rude tongues and the degeneracy that surely must have followed uh, generations in the desert, mm -hmm. which is... It was hilarious. I had to read it twice. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the first easy question that came to mind. Why doesn't he just call it the Egyptian tongue? I mean, that's first a bold claim. And yeah. second seems to be what he unerringly states. Yeah. And it yeah. is a fascination with Egypt. But nobody seems to be willing to go back and directly talk about it. What you know what's really funny too about that is early on when I first discovered that um Hebrew had to be an ideographic language, um I started looking a lot at hieroglyphic and learning what I could, at least at a novice level, the basics of, of hieroglyphics and what they're made of. And it, if what they tell us is true about hieroglyphics. It, uh, it's a language of a gigantic amount of both pictures and letters. And there's nothing about it except for a few basic mechanisms that are in any way related to Obrey as a pictographic language. In fact, I would go far enough to say that there, there's not much about it that is even that related to Hebrew 
as an expression of these Masoretes, or I would think more accurately as an expression from the various peoples that moved into um, the land occupied by the tribes after Asher carried them away. And he, he'll actually get into that. He has a very interesting point of view on that, too. Um, I just don't that... see uh, the correlation. Personally, I, I never have, which is so strange that he would he would believe so strongly if he does in fact believe that or did um that this was a tongue from from Egypt it's it's just a, it's a real shocker to me he he has so much to say and biblically i am a neophyte so even as i read the kjv or septuagint translations it doesn't matter which I am reading it and taking it at face value and attempting to make my own thoughts and steer clear of a lot of the, this is how you should read the Bible in this portion. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, okay. But the, the things that he says about, about both Egypt and Moses, and yeah, when I got to the Asher part, I... I had to step back and think, is this what other people think? Because it sounds, it's, it's news to me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that I had thought of. Now, mm -hmm. when he talks mm -hmm. about, and it's funny, I reread Exodus um, all this week, actually, because someone had mentioned, um, the story of Moses, the cartoon that they did. I think it was Disney. And I was thinking about how Aaron just doesn't exist. A.A. Ron does not exist in any of these retellings. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered that Dolive had said this. He had talked about how educated Moses was. Yeah. And how how renowned Moses was for his education, but it reminds me of that Exodus verse. In Exodus 4, verse 10, Moses says he's not eloquent, right. that he's slow of speech and slow of tongue. He right. basically says, listen, God, I don't know how to talk to a crowd. Mm -hmm. And this seems so contrary with with everything that everyone attributes to Moses. Yeah. And we have Dolive saying that surely Moses, having written and in his genius way created the Sefer and even stated the books before him, that Moses, Moses was initiated. He had his sure set of hieroglyphs. And I thought that was... That was interesting because I don't think that a lot of what we see in the way of Egyptian hieroglyphs are real. Mm -hmm. That's a it's a large claim to make, but mm -mm. well, you know what? Um, there there is no shortage of scholars out there, specifically from around Dialovitz time, that had a a, a real serious problem with the. Uh, the the set the translational set that uh came out from Champollion um it, it, when you look into the people that supposedly discovered a lot of artifacts over in the Middle East um it's like a who's who of em employees for the Dutch East India Company um higher ups in in some of the most um, occultic universities, uh, associates of international bankers. So, you know, you get the drift. And, uh, you know, so even something as fundamental as, for instance, the, uh, uh, what was it? It wasn't the, uh, the Merneptah Stella. Maybe it was the Merneptah Stella that was su supposedly then it had uh, three languages on it. And, and it was what helped to, uh, to translate the, the, the whole set of, of what was hieroglyphics and they worked off of it. 
I, I maybe actually it might have been the Rosetta Stone. The Merneptah Stella was the one I think where they claimed that um, uh, that the Israelites were mentioned. Anyways, yeah. Just it, all you got to do is you know you always want to consider the source, and the source of what we understand as hieroglyphics and who it came from, who the discoverers were. Uh, it, it is, it's really a huge, who's who of thugs and ne'er-do-wells in three piece suits from about two centuries ago. Uh, now if, if you'll forgive me, I actually have to let my dog out real quick. <laughs> She's whining like crazy. Uh, give me one moment, please. I, oh, I, no, go I'm it. sorry. If you, if you want to fill the time while I'm doing that, it'll take me uh, 30 seconds. I apologize. Sure. I'm taking over. All right, so Jonathan knows far more about the scripture and and this particular vein of study than I could ever hope to. It's something about when you begin before someone, you'll you'll never be caught by them. But as we read this book, um, it led to so many tangents that. I'm not even sure that a bi-weekly video will cover it. We could do this for a year just pouring over this book. And it's incredibly dense. So Agreed. if anybody wants to fill up the comments section, wants to message us with insights, and especially with ideas on these people at the time, he will, he will bombard you in the first 36 pages with people's names and either to the positive or the negative mm -hmm. and if anyone has any knowledge or insight on them and how they may relate to this i'd love to hear it i want to talk about this yeah that's what i yeah because the thing is we're we're 40 minutes in and we haven't even scratched the surface of all of the amazing claims made just within section one. And we probably can't, which is why I link to the digital copy of this book in every episode, whether I'm producing this uh, via a podcast or, or YouTube video or uh, bit shoot, because it is, it's, it is just that dense and you will get lost. In, in just checking these claims. If you're somebody who likes to be thorough and you like to check claims, you like to check sources, it's it's kind of insane. Which is why, uh, to some degree, um, I'm trying to broad stroke it. Uh, I've been looking at some of the highlights and notes that I made just as we've been talking. And the thing is, most of them I've chosen not to even really bring up because it could get us so far into to one area um but the underlying i i suppose is this i guess that i'll just reinforce he is trying to tell us as he sees it and he is passing this off as true and correct he doesn't very frequently say i think i believe it is my opinion that that is not very frequent uh, especially on some of the most uh, pivotal points in this narrative. The first one being that he does present it as a fact that the time in Egypt, as he sees it, affected the, the Hebrews, so-called, <laughs> so much. And it's so hard to relate this, too, because all of our Bibles are full of Egypt and Hebrews, not Mitzram and Obrim. Um, and that's been one of the biggest challenges that, that I've faced when talk, even either if it's talking about something like this, that's, uh, any, any kind of narrative, it doesn't have to be even mainstream. It could be, uh, a, a more esoteric narrative. <clears throat> it's all using the same language and it is all perpetrating the same misconceptions. Just getting that name <clears throat> out of your head, Egypt is a huge step. And that's that's only one of the the many uh, 
seemingly small details that have been altered in at least the Old Testament. And the New Testament is a whole different story because we're talking about a whole different language. And as far as I'm concerned, not an original language either. So this this first part here, basically he is asserting uh, the, the idea of, and, and it's a, the common idea, is that all of these events happened in the Middle East, around Palestine, the Levant, Egypt. He is asserting that uh, our assumptions about Egyptology are, for the most part, correct. And that the Hebrews were in Egypt for 430 years, which they were only there for 215 because there were only three generations while they were in Mitzrim. Um and then that changed their language to a degree, and then they came out, and we have it forward. Now, I'm actually viewing right now the uh, the second section, which is the authenticity of the Sefer of Moses, vicissitudes experienced by this book. Now, in part, mm-hmm. you already commented on that, but because he does. He says uh, straightforward in these sections how he thinks it's... Uh, He thinks it's unthinkable to assert that the Sefer of Moses. So when he says Sefer of Moses, I know he's he's speaking of what he translated, but in another way, he's speaking of everything attributed to Moses. So that would be from Genesis to Deuteronomy, the five books that are commonly called Torah. Um, You know, he he makes it very blunt. And and the thing is, many occultists will say the same thing. A lot of people need to be aware of how, uh, even how pro-Christian or oftentimes pro-New Testament books like the Zohar are. And, you know, is he giving lip service to this stuff with an ulterior motive? Are these things that he truly believes I guess we're not far enough along with him to know if that's the case or not. Um, I can tell you that he already strikes me as, as a bit unstable, which again could just, that could just be from the fact that maybe his theories are not grounded in fact. And when that happens, you just can't help but be unstable in your assertions. Um, but he, he has, sorry, Go ahead. No, 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 please. He has this idea of Egypt right at the time where let's assume that we're all on the same page. There is a lot to suggest that Egypt is not what it seems, not where it seems. And he would have been writing this in a time when that great shuffle was being enacted so this is this is him in real time reinforcing a forced narrative of the mm-hmm. state and style of what we now refer to as Egypt. Mm-hmm. But the entire first page of uh, section two of this dissertation, he plainly states some heavy statements, and then goes straight into the second paragraph with anecdotes, metaphors, and emotional attacks to to reinforce his initial points. Yeah. And he has one thing that if you if you study any of this, does not make any sense. He says Do not the savage nations advance towards civilization and those which are civilized toward the acquisition of sciences? And and he relates a general progression in a single direction. Yeah. This is the opposite of what he states when he talks about the Hebraic tongue. He says that it is a degeneracy. Correct. (laughs) Correct. Right. So again... You know, whether he's uh, being unconsciously contradictory or not, 
He does. He does that in the first page. He starts out with the Bible, which we possess, was far from being the exact translation of the Sefer of Moses. Right. But then he goes on to say, but isn't that the way of man to advance? You know, we don't stay savages. We go forward. Well, um, and then he goes, here uh, we go. <laughs> this book is about how we went backward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's <Right>? beautiful. <laughs> I know. I know. It, it almost seems like a guy speaking with a forked tongue, you know. Um, I wonder how well respected this argument was initially. I mean, for all the words and verbiage used, I wonder if people saw through it and criticized it or if it was a, a cherished work when it was published it's always hard to know because um a lot of the uh criticisms that were published concerning the king james version when it was first published have been wiped off the record because people would like more people to be king james onlyists uh, they don't seem to understand how many problems there were with that first edition <laughs> if it was inspired well then i guess uh god uh, wanted the translators to literally um, print, or wanted the printer at least, to print, thou shalt commit adultery in the Ten Commandments. They forgot the not. Uh, but anyways, yeah, Gorgeous. there were a lot of, there were a lot of criticisms at the time, but a lot of them have been wiped. There was a lot of criticism. Oh yeah, the the lens looking back into the past and the King James, it it seems unanimous that this was the new greatest translation mm. and like just like you said mm. if it was inspired okay it's inspired but we had to uh fix some stuff yeah it's... some of the the finest hebrew scholars in england were disinvited to that event some of the finest scholars and those guys who they, who worked on it they were not uh, contrary to what the King James apologists tried to convince everybody of, those guys were not the leading Hebrew or Greek scholars of their day. They were Anglicans. They probably knew Latin pretty well because that's all Anglicanism was, was uh, Catholicism without the Pope. The, the King of England was the Pope. Uh, I do find something really interesting that i i did highlight in a block because it's it's one of the more interesting things at least to to what we're trying to get at um out of this second section if i may read it's starting on page 23 he says it is well known that the fathers of the church have believed until saint jerome that the hellenistic version called the septuagint was a divine work written by prophets rather than by simple translators often even unaware from what St. Augustine says, that another original existed. But it is also known that St. Jerome, judging this version corrupt in innumerable passages and by no means exact, substituted a Latin version for it that was considered the only authentic one by the Council of Trent, and in defense of which the Inquisition has not feared to kindle the flames of the stake. Thus the fathers have contradicted beforehand the decision of the Council, and the decision of the Council has, in its turn, condemned the opinion of the fathers, so that one could not find Luther entirely wrong when he said that the Hellenistic interpreters had not an exact knowledge of Hebrew, and that their version was as void of meaning as of harmony. Since he followed the sentiment of St. Jerome, sanctioned in some degree by the council, nor even blamed Calvin and the other wise reformers for having doubted the authenticity of the Vulgate, notwithstanding the infallible decision of the council, since St. Augustine had indeed condemned this work according to the idea that every church had formed in this time. Now, what's interesting about that, and he's right, he, there were many scholars who rightly condemned what Greek versions were available, so we'll, Septuagint, the Old Testament, and there were ones who rightly condemned Latin. Now, I have all of these versions in my e-sword, and I look at all of them as much as possible. 
and I I also have the um, the uh, t- 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 not the apostolic. I got the apostolic uh, polyglot Bible on my e sword, but um, it was Jimenez's Complutation Polyglot. I have as well, uh, which actually has Hebrew, Latin, and Greek all in columns for the Old Testament. Um, the interesting thing about that, and he does point out some of the problems too with, with the Greek is that if guys like Luther or guys like Jerome saw all of the problems with the Septuagint and you need some, you need to listen to the people today who argue that the the Septuagint was the version of the Bible that they used in the New Testament, the say that Jesus and the apostles used in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. And they, they point out all of the passages which uh, fit better than the, the Masoretic. Um, I wish that we had at hand, um, and, and many of these things we can find, because he does footnote really well, Um all of the criticisms <clears throat> concerning the problems inherent in using Greek to to translate from Obri. Um, now, I never, uh, I haven't for a long time believed that the Septuagint, any version of the Old Testament in Greek, was taken from pure Obri. I think it was actually taken from Masoretic, and that it's actually more recent than not. I, I have a real problem with the letter of uh, Orestes that, that is supposed to be the, uh, the smoking gun that vouches for the veracity of the Septuagint. But when you consider how many people had such a, a big problem with Greek and it being used to translate the Old Testament from, how can they not have such a problem with the New Testament being written in Greek, because it's rife with the same kind of grammatical issues as the Septuagint. But somehow most people aren't seeing the two together. And yes, completely agreed. And not only does it have the same issues, it's tainted by the customs and idioms and prejudices of the time in which it was written. Yes. And so this, uh, people like to refer to the Bible as a whole, but I can't look at them as a whole. The uh-huh. Old and New Testaments, I mean, they, they deserve each consideration and you cannot apply one formula to the dissemination of the other. Mm-hmm. It's it's a difficulty, and that's funny that you you read that whole block because at the very end, the next paragraph that you uh, where you stopped, mm-hmm. I had actually highlighted that entire block and then spent a lot of time on his bullet point there at the bottom, which took him a full page. <laughs> To, to type out yes and it's this is where he gets into as i said earlier so many dense claims stacked on one another mm-hmm. that for you to refute his overarching claim you'll need to dive into the many claims that make it up and it I think this part is awful. I mean, it's chock full of what he thinks or he wants people to think, but mm-hmm. that's a, it was a tough page to get through, 24 and 25. Yeah. Um, especially because he states that Hebrew is a branch of the original Egyptian, a forking of their tongue whose meaning is lost. Sure. But then he finishes by saying... He can't say why because it's not his area of expertise. <laughs> yeah, right. And I just <clears throat> like I make we hear this in the news all the time. Yeah. We have this and we can't get into the evidence, trust us. Yeah, he does that I, quite often. I do not like to trust. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, he says at the bottom of page 25, um, when he said, I, I, I've said that I consider the Hebraic idi- uh, idiom contained in the Sefer as a transplanted branch of the Egyptian tongue. This is an assertion, the historical proof of which I cannot give at this moment, because it would draw me into details too foreign to my subject. But, I mean, he really puts in a lot of uh, odd details. We'll see if... There's just no way, even with the length of this book, um, I don't think there's any way that he's going to be able to prove that one. It's just going to... I think he would have been... um, a little more trustworthy had he said that he believed that and just couldn't prove it herein. He had a suspicion um, because I don't think he could. I don't think he could, he could do both. So it's a, and, and the funny thing is how you said that, 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 that really is a, uh, that really is a common technique that's used is to actually plant an idea in somebody's head and to give them also the idea that you have authority for that, and then to leave it hanging, uh, to never prove it. But what once you plant that idea uh, in the minds of readers or hearers, they can't unplant it. It's there. Um, yeah. And I'm Gee. sure it's a technique, <clears throat> to yes, be honest. Yes, the, the logical fallacy of appeal to authority is is one of the most foolproof ones because yeah. don't believe it go ask go ask so and so or uh, especially when you refer to someone else as an authority because you must refute that other person's authority in order to refute this claim so it's dangerous and well used but if you're familiar with it you can spot it yeah. um page 26 he really gets into the hebrew bashing on this and i i want to know what you thought about that and i'll give you a quote from it okay uh i ask in all good faith whether a rude tribe deprived of all literature without civil or religious institutions that might hold it together could not assume the tongue of the country in which it lived a tribe which transported to Babylon for only 70 years, and while it formed the core of a nation ruled by its particular law, submissive to an exclusive cult, was unable to preserve its maternal tongue and bartered it for the Syriac Aramaean, a sort of Chaldaic dialect. For it is well known that Hebrew, lost from this epoch, ceased to be the vulgar tongue of the Jews. Mm. That is well, that's chocked full of stuff. It is. And um, right here is where he is, as usual, <clears throat> conflating Egypt with Mitzram and the preconceptions that we have, that we've been taught, not, not that we would get from um, an unperverted reading of the Bible, uh, here's the thing, you know, the, the Hebrews are not as he is presenting them, nor were the Mitzri as he's presenting them as, as Egyptians. Um, this was not a, a culture high advanced of them, but we are talking about a people who were a family descended from a man who had come from uh, a city of the the Kajdim. Now he does talk a bit about the Kajdim or Chaldees um, as he goes, but the, these people came from this patriarch Abram, who had lived among these Kajdim. He wasn't uneducated. He wasn't poor. He wasn't merely a farmer or shepherd. Um, I point this out in the patriarchs, the livestock, and the land. The fact that Abram had, within only a few years of coming to the land of Canaan, he had enough people with him that he was able to take 400 of his best young trained men to go and rescue his nephew Lot. And even though the, uh, the Mitzri were definitely 
they were arrogant. Um, they would not eat with people who were professional shepherds. Um, now, I actually think that that implies that and other passages that the Mitzri, even back then, may have been to a degree vegetarians because the the Obrim also long for the uh, variety of vegetables that they used to enjoy uh, back in Mitzram, which I think some of those might not even be available uh, to be able to grow in Egypt in their climate. Um, but what he's doing is he is, he's misrepresenting, first off, who the Hebrews were, and they were called Hebrews because of their language. They were called Obrim. Um, and he's definitely misrepresenting who the Mitzri were by calling them Egyptian. Very different people. And, you know, I again, I, I know I'm going to really beat on this, but um, I don't even see the Egyptians of old being accurately represented through Egyptology. It seems like Egyptology, uh, I don't know that the occult sprung or the affinity that the occult has. I don't know that it sprung from Egyptology instead of that Egyptology sprung from the occult. Um, yes, they needed a safe place to say all of their information came from. Mm -hmm. And this is the creation of Egypt. I, I feel the same way. Yeah. The, and, and that's why there's such a marked difference between what you'll actually read about Mitzram and the people of Mitzram, um, and what you have been taught and what you perceive about Egypt and the people of Egypt. They're not the same. They're nothing alike. The empires are nothing alike. The people are nothing alike. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that's the biggest thrust of what I have to say is, is that he is whether whether he's doing it in ignorance or not, he is incorrectly conflating um, bad perceptions about the Hebrews with biblical perceptions. It's just completely different than the narrative. Probably most people listening to this, and if they haven't, I don't know if I'd tell you to or not. There was a series of movies produced by um, Ted Turner um, probably 20 years ago uh, about the patriarchs. There was a movie made about Abraham. Uh, there was one made about um, Jacob and his sons and, and maybe one other. I can't remember. Um, <clears throat> but the thing is, he, he perpetuated those Myths and stereotypes, you know, you see them traveling from Aur, which actually that that means light or of the Kajdim, not Ur of the Chaldees, with this little ragtag band of like poor looking shepherds, you know, <laughs> it's just that wasn't the case. He was actually a very affluent man, Abram. Um, and even though by the time that the patriarchs were born, so that's the 12 sons of Jacob, mm -hmm. they, yeah, they were, they were cattlemen. Um, you know, they weren't refined. Jacob starts out being refined and he's a bit of a, a deceptive guy. And what happens is he has a, a life changing event and he turns very much into uh, a cattleman himself something very different than he used to be. And that yes. kind of marks what these people are like for some time. And it, it's sort of what they become, too, in Mitzram, because they go to Mitzram, they're given some of the best portions of the land, being Goshen, and they develop basically as cattlemen there. And by the time a couple of centuries are up, that's pretty much mostly all they've known. Um, however, there's still no reason to believe that they lost their language or that it changed whatsoever within that time. This, yeah, this has been, for all of my people listening, I've, I've been digging up Grand Solar Minimum and catastrophe references, not only in, in Genesis Exodus again, but in this book as well, from the isolation of the 
uh, the Chinese and the supposed development of their perfect written language as a result. But yes, when they have Goshen, this there is a famine and they are given the knowledge that this famine will last for a certain time. And what do they do? They proceed to engage in predatory capitalism. Mm -hmm. And at the end of this famine, just because they control the food, now they control everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. Well, they sold their land and even their freedom just yeah. to stay alive. But yeah. what is this? This is a catastrophe cycle. And... Yeah. Of course, I've been digging into catastrophes on my end, mm -hmm. but but this isn't the first time that they talk about it. And so they may have been, I just, I took a bit of issue when you said they had been given the land of, of Goshen. This was an inside job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I read well, it, I just was, couldn't shake that. I mean, Joseph, so Joseph, the second to the youngest brother of the twelve. He's mm -hmm. the one given the interpretation of dreams, right? Pharaoh has the dream. He gives Pharaoh the interpretation of the seven years of plenty, then the seven years of famine. And yeah. it is Joseph. I mean, nobody make m any mistake. It is Joseph that really shrewdly, because he tells, it's, it's actually Proa, but f Pharaoh, he tells him to appoint a man who's very shrewd uh, over his affairs, because he does see it as something where he can gain a lot. This, you know, and so that's the job that he's given is he is given the job to be over all of the affairs of Pharaoh. And mm -hmm. he does negotiate a lot of land taking from people, basically Mitzri, uh, Kanoni and other peoples um, that come there because they don't have food. While, yes, his family is given the best portion of land because of this dream that he was given and of course in the in the in a broad overview the way you would see this as this people this little and they are very small people compared to the empires around them it doesn't mean they're some kind of dusty ignorant people they're just a very small one at this time because of what's going on with Joseph and the advantages that he has and how wealthy he makes pharaoh yes. it does work out for them in, in that way, but unfortunately, in a couple of centuries, it's going to work very badly for them because a couple of pharaohs down the road, and he looks at how big they've gotten, and he decides uh, they're going to be a problem, and that's when the infanticide starts. Yes, and everything you know rolls along. But yeah, it that, is Joseph that that does broker a lot of those deals, taking land and stuff from people. That's he true. does. Joseph Joseph <laughs> creates. During this this time of need, he uses it to his advantage to to create an empire, yeah, and to place his people at the head of it, yeah, and and yeah, it took a couple generations before a pharaoh saw what had been done and wanted to undo it, and then it was time to leave. Well, actually, was, all of that possession, though, all of that possession that that Joseph acquired was a possession for Pharaoh. So yes, Joseph that's didn't what I actually, mean. He, okay. He, yeah. in that time, he created an empire for Pharaoh, but he placed his people in the best positions. Well, not and positions. Welcomed them. Uh, actually, the best I'm land. I'm saying it wrong. That, yes. Okay. Okay, because I was thinking Basically, like. Basically, he, yeah. he got everybody in. Yeah. And he made sure his people had the best. Yeah. They had this the sweetest land period, yeah, and yeah. and and the the narrative Which, yeah. shows how he um he tells his brothers what to tell Pharaoh, um because he said this is going to make him do this. I mean, he yeah, he definitely um he he helps the whole thing along, yeah, yeah. and and does give them the the best, and yeah, what happens is. Um, yeah, a Pharaoh that doesn't know him sees that, that this is a problem and, and yeah, and that's when all, all health kind of starts to break loose. Yeah. And um, that's, that's Pharaoh doing the old self-fulfilling prophecy. I need to stop this. And then he causes this, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was quite interesting that, that not only 
does uh, does the Bible reference these these specific times of catastrophe as being regular, but that Dolave uses this in his points to to name the I guess you would say the progression or regression mm-hmm. of language. Mm-hmm. Now, on page I'm, I'm going to 20... point out something. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, Go I'm going to point out something, and then please talk about what you were going to, because I got to let the dog back in. <laughs> but it, it's funny. Um, Dialave actually uses the term that a lot of people have for a while and applied it to, I think, incorrectly to the Hebrews. He uses the term shepherd kings. Now, that's never a biblical term ever, ever. That, as far as I'm concerned, is an occult term um, concerning the Hebrews. And that's all I wanted to point out. Now, now go ahead with your thing, and I'll, I'll be right back on. I don't know if he can hear this, but when I read Shepherd Kings, um, it made me think of Sephard or Sephardic. And so I, I thought, yes, it took me out of the moment when I read that, and I wondered if that was Dolave being clever again. All right. So I'm on page 27, and here he dips into a million old names to... to bolster his point on acquiring wisdom, but he talks about Moses being instructed in all the sciences of the Egyptians. He says, now had not Moses been instructed in all the sciences of the Egyptians? Had he not, as the historian of the Acts of the Apostles insinuated, begun there to be mighty in words and deeds? Yeah. Yeah, he's quoting from Acts chapter 7, the uh, dissertation of Stephen. Yeah, um, it, yeah it's, it's 7, um, let's see, I'm going to get the exact uh, text of it, because that, that could be a little bit misunderstood. Um, uh, 7 well. verse 22. Yeah, there it is. Sorry. Um, right, he learned all the wisdom of the Egyptians and, and was mighty in words and deeds now how accurately that's translated mighty in words and deeds a little strange but you know that in a sense in the new testament that's kind of par for the course since oddly enough the new testament seems to uphold all of the all of the modern misconceptions concerning locale and people and tongues and I still haven't figured out why that is and how that works, because there are, uh, and I'm sorry if, if this really upsets uh, a lot of my people or, or folks who um, are looking for me to, to, to tow any party line, but there are serious, serious despairing discrepancies basically information discrepancies, not narrative discrepancies. There's not necessarily any kind of uh, differential voice from old to new, but there is serious um, technical discrepancies. Does it, does it really say mighty in words and deeds? Um, Or, is the word being used or translated by whoever uh, translated this from its original language mean a little bit more that, um, let me see if I can give one of the a better Obrey words that might be used for mighty and misinterpreted as mighty. If it was Gabur, then it, it could mean that, but if it was another word, it could possibly mean something like he grew very much in learning language and, and other things. It's just really hard to tell. Um, 
And then, you know, it's not just a one-off in Greek. It's a two-off because it's a three-off because he's quoting that in whatever version he had in French, which has then been translated to English. <laughs> so, you know, I don't even know what French version he was using of the Bible. You know, but obviously whoever uh, translated it was using English. Yeah. That... Now, was he mighty in words and deeds by the time he was 40? And he killed that Mitzri who was, was beating an Obri and then fled. And then in the next 40 years, he, he experienced so much life change that he became uh, far more an introvert and very bad with speaking with people and speaking in public. That's possible, too. People change. Um, and, and there are blocks of time in our life that mark significant changes. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people go through a very significant change in their 20s uh, and then again in their 40s. This can be health changes. This can be personality changes. This can be all kinds of things. And it's very possible that at one time he was a very different kind of person than he was yes. 40 years later. And knowledge can can surely make the headstrong and verbose much more reticent. Now, this him having to flee after he killed that man. Sure, but I wonder if it is a mark of wisdom or a mark of um, abject truth when he says that he is uh, feeble in, in tongue and wit mm -hmm. and is sent to Aaron for assistance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole thing puzzled me, especially as I read it with uh, with claims by Dolive. He says Simplicius, who up to a certain point had been able to make this comparison, found so much that was conformable that he concluded that the prophet of the Hebrews had walked in the footsteps of the ancient Thoth. Uh -huh. Now that's, mm. that is... That is a statement which is a far cry from what you do read. That this man is so learned that in his life he he was placed on the same pedestal as the greats. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh and of course you don't you don't get that in the biblical narrative either. You know, even though those first five books are attributed to Moses by later authors and speakers. Um, and that's both Old and New Testament. However, if, if you, you just read and pay attention to the wording um, and the certain types of repetition, um, stories repeated, um, but just in those first five books, it's pretty clear that Moses himself either uh, didn't write any and probably had one or more secretaries that wrote a lot of these things, or that he wrote part, and other people that he had um, as secretaries, and I can't think of a better word than secretary, but that'll work, wote other parts. Um, of course, it doesn't make him mm, ignorant scribes. Yeah, just had scribes with him that that were in charge of recording certain things. It, it doesn't make him ignorant, nor does it make him brilliant. He was a very regular guy, I, basically. And especially by the time that he came back to Mitzram um, and participated in the Exodus. There was the, and that's another thing is, um, and it's, it's a, an occult theme, is the in a sense, the, uh, the deification of a number of figures from the Bible. Whereas if you, if you, you know, just read the Bible and pay attention to what it says, these people, none of the people are, are deified in any way. In fact, they right. are more demonized than deified. It, it's, it's a real, um, false argument to assert that the Bible is somehow Jewish propaganda is insane um, because yeah. there's never anybody deified. Now, maybe today's Jews claiming to be the descendants 
of the Israelites and Hebrews, maybe they deify people like David and Abraham and Solomon, but the Bible never does any such thing, not to anybody. Yeah, that is its basic idolatry and hero worship, whereas everything that, at least in the first five books, it features people who are given duties. That's it. People who are given duties. And oftentimes you see these patriarchs and, and heads of their families in their old age being tricked or deceived by their sons who in their old age are given duties and then deceived by their sons. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah. it's a common theme. But yeah. so uh, does that mean that you disagree with the end of that page, 27? Because he he gets into what people think about Moses and mm-hmm. how uh, some people say, and he calls them idiots. Yeah. <laughs> some people say that they're just scattered memoirs whose uh-huh. fragments he himself or his secretaries patch together. Mm-hmm. And then he he heaps more if this then that logical fallacies to say that if you don't believe that Moses wrote this, then you too are an idiot. Well, here's the thing. And so may, I might be an idiot, but here's the thing about it. Um, to say that five books are the books of Moses, which is, is what they're called. They're, they're sometimes called the law. Sometimes they're called Moses. All right, to say that those are the books of Moses, does that necessarily insinuate that Moses himself had a hand in writing all of it or or any of it? Or by calling them the books of Moses, does it then imply that they are the five books having to do and were probably written or collated within the time of Moses, or that Moses was the chief figure associated with the dispensation of the law, which most of the material covered in those five books is about. I guess you have to consider what is it exactly being said when someone, when, when other authors or speakers in the Bible call them the books of Moses. Yeah. Um, Now, I won't be devil's advocate, but I'll be Dolive's advocate for a second. He says in the very next page, as a point, um, it's certain that Moses made use of more ancient books and sacerdotal memoirs, but he does not hide it. He cites in two or three passages of the Sefer the title of the works which are before his eyes. Mm Mm-hmm. And so he he goes on to state generations of Adam. Sorry, hold on. There. Yeah. He goes on to state generations of Adam, uh, the book of the wars of the Lord, yeah, and the book of the sayings of the seers. Mm-hmm. And then uh, what was a bit of dissociation? The book of Jasher is mentioned in Joshua. Yeah. I, I may be slow, but I don't understand what reference that has to that argument. Yeah, I don't either. (laughs) Honestly, (laughs) no, I don't. Maybe it's just, uh, I guess, a bland correlation. But he's basically saying that Moses did this all for his accounting and that it's what a genius does. (laughs) Hmm. Yeah, um, let me uh, let me just say one one more thing on that, and it's I a know dense that claim. Yeah, because I know that we have to get into at least the portion of of his claims in these first three sections concerning Esther or or I'm sorry Ezra or Esdras. Um, so you know, here's the thing. Um, I think a lot of people who I would consider Orthodox have raised questions concerning, okay, you know, when something says here is the generations of, um, does that necessarily mean it was its own separate work or not? Not sure. 
um, whoever is writing Genesis is writing it in a way that seems not only sometimes contemporaneous, but other times as a reflection. Did Moses collate existing books? Um, did he do it by memory? Was he looking at certain works, comparing them? Or did he just know that these other things were in other books? And this is where the idea, again, of people, in a sense, progressing is implied again, like as if we have progressed when I firmly believe we've, if anything, regressed. Um, I think they had libraries back then. I, I read the book of Joshua and, well, let's just say I read from Exodus to Judges. And as I read it, I'm thinking, you know what, when whoever penned this, I think they knew full well that the immediate readers of it would have maps that they could at least access while they were reading it. Um, so, no, you know, I, I just don't see the the same popular uh, perception of a progression of man in this world. I see I see nothing but regression. Um, that's Agreed. why I just don't I don't conclude you know, that they were driving Flintstones cars and wearing bedsheets. Uh, I really don't. Um, but, you know, images are powerful. And like as in his constant bringing up of Egypt and then just dropping it and moving on. Uh, just planting ideas is very powerful. And we've all had that done to us our whole lives. I just choose to not believe any of those things. And I don't really care at this point in my life who thinks I'm an idiot for doing that really doesn't matter. Really doesn't matter because it doesn't make me any worse off. Um, but yeah, I, I did want to, uh, this is, this is really bad because when we get from page 30 on, it, it is going to continue to be terrifically dense. And we are going to get a bit into the, the Jewish aspect as far as, Jewish traditional books, and I did do a lot of highlighting. I did do a, not, a lot of notation. 30, um, yeah, 30 got pretty heavy for me from page 30 on. Yeah. I, <laughs> I actually had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. You know, it was. I mean, it it definitely got out of the, uh, the, the clunkiness of the preceding uh, 20-something pages into now, something that was a little more well-directed, but yeah. still, in my opinion, wrong. There's a there's a statement that he makes, which I think actually pretty well closes out his Moses argument mm -hmm. and, and brings it into the rest. Um, he says the rabbis state that Moses surely passed down the true oral law in secret only to reliable men in the form of Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. He says the Jews are confident they still possess it. Mm hmm. And and his statement here, Dolive said you know, he's quoting mm -hmm. rabbis, or at least paraphrasing the views of them as a whole. Yeah, uh, with no nuance, but I mean they do present as a whole. Yeah. Um, but the tone of the entire passage seems to say that Dolive disagrees with this completely. Mm -hmm. He states more than once that this is him reclaiming a degenerated form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, here's the thing. So the whole tradition of all rabbinic literature, all of it, goes back to the idea that even though it wasn't recorded whatsoever— in the Bible or any other early work that Moses on Mount Sinai was given a written law and an oral law. And the oral law was passed on to trusted elders, uh, basically in secret while the written law was of course written and then trans transferred by scribes. Um, 
this is sort of the foundation of occultism, period. It is the foundation of so many brands or forms of, of occultism that we know of today, whether it be uh, Hermeticism, Kabbalah, of course, um, Freemasonry. And I know they, they, they more focus on, on Solomonic stuff, but, uh, and, and it is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the, uh, again, preconceived notions here that this idea that, that, all of these rabbinic writings have, which, of course, I believe was come up with from these various peoples who were moved in by Asher in the time of Second Kings chapter 17 and forward. Uh, it, it does have a lot to do with blood that goes way back to Genesis 2 and 3 as well. But that's one of the reasons that there is so much complexity to the Bible, because there's a lot to be understood concerning people, blood, enemies, events, actions, and what we're dealing with today, and you got to pay attention to all of it. Now, one of the most damaging uh, preconceived notions, too, is that this um, this set of, of rabbinic writings, so the, the, the Mishnah, which is part of the Talmud, and then the Kabbalah, which the Talmud would technically fall under the heading of Kabbalah, um, and all of this other stuff, uh, Gemaras, which are, are part of Talmud too, and there's mm -hmm. a heck of a lot of other rabbinic writings. Now, here's the, the real bad part too, is that it's, it's commonly believed by most people that these are what Jesus is referring to when he is criticizing the Pharisees of his day for um, following the traditions of the elders instead of the commandments of God. That is one of the worst, most damaging uh, notions that there is. You see, for anybody who spent any good time reading the Talmud or the Zohar, anything Kabbalistic or rabbinic, you know that not only is it completely full of just abominable sorts of ideas and very dark uh, sort of opinions and practices, um, if that is was actually the sort of literature that the Pharisees of Jesus's day were were vouching for, um, he probably would have killed them rather than corrected them. We're, we're talking about a completely different sort of literature. That stuff is so foul, so vulgar. I mean, you look, people were being cheated in the temple, and he took and made a whip and turned over tables and beat these people out of the temple. And I guess it just goes to show how little we know about Talmud and Kabbalah, that people would believe that what he was referring to by traditions or traditions of the elders had anything to do with Kabbalah and Talmud. Traditions of the elders is the stuff that you kind of see being practiced in today's churches. Hey, why do we celebrate Christmas and, and Easter and all that stuff when we can't really find that in the Bible? What we find in the Bible is Passover and unleavened bread and Shavuot and Sukkot. And why don't we do those things? Well, I mean, there's no biblical basis, even in the New Testament, for these things. Well, it's no, tradition. And, it's yeah. tradition. That's the tradition of the elders. And I'm not saying they were having Christmas, but we can even see practices <laughs> like that. We can see practices like that in the Old Testament. Baking special cakes for the Queen of Heaven on certain days. That's the kind of junk he was talking about. Um, how they had to wash their hands at certain times. Now, rabbis may have incorporated that into their Talmud or Kabbalistic writings. Sure thing. But that does not mean that he was referring to what we know of today as Kabbalah and Talmud. They did different things, and I'm not kidding. They are vulgarly different things. Oh, yeah. And that's... <laughs> He's not going to, to criticize into. child molesters. 
Okay. He himself would have taken them and wrapped the chain around their neck and threw them into the deepest sea. There's just a marked difference is what I'm trying to say. But he doesn't, he doesn't approach this. He's not going to in this book because this is one of the most um, badly believed misconceptions is that the traditions of the elders equals Talmud and Kabbalah. Just needed to say that because it's a, a freaking nightmare that that's actually believed. But No, and there's a reason that we're not familiar with the Zohar, the Bahir, the Medrashim, uh, the two Gemaras that make the Talmud, all of these, because this is a, a perceived secret. And this is it. What, what is the key to having a secret weapon? Everyone knows you have it. You don't even need to actually have a weapon. You just need everyone to know that you have a secret weapon. And this is what the gematria is. It does exist, but as to the, the provenance of such a thing and the Kabbalah and this, this idea that Moses passed down the true law in secret... This, this is one of the first and biggest lies that I, it's just cringeworthy to think about. Mm -hmm. You don't need to actually have anything up your sleeves. You just need someone to think you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he perpetuates it, this throughout this book. Yeah, he does. <clears throat> uh, along with a, with a few other ideas that again we're going to see and this is why I wanted to get to the Esdras part because this is going to be another uh this is going to be another really main thrusting theme throughout this book not only the idea that uh Hebrew as we know it even though he says well it's changed since then and I'm going to restore it I he I think he he really is saying what he's going to restore is the Hebrew that there was after the 400 years in Egypt when it had been changed into something more like Egyptian. That's what he's looking at it as, because he's looking at, <clears throat> he's looking at Moses having written the, the first five books, uh, Torah, after Egypt, and the language then already being changed drastically from what it was uh, during the narrative of time that we would have had before that. So <clears throat> that's assumption one. Um, I don't know how much, because I've, I've read forward it, a number of passages, how much credence he gives to the rabbis, although he does equate the Jews of his day, which are basically the same as of today, with the Hebrews and Judahites and Israelites of old, which I don't. That's another assumption. And then the assumption on top of that is that the tradition of the elders spoken of by Jesus or the apostles is the Kabbalah, Midrash, Talmud. Again, another assumption. And then here's the other real heavy one that he'll stay with for the rest of this book, unfortunately, is uh, a good passage of it is on page 34. He says, furthermore, Esdras did not act alone in this matter. Now, he's talking about changing. He believes another time it was changed was in Babylon. They went to Babylon for 70 years. That mm -hmm. is recorded in the Bible. It's actually yeah. Babel. It's never called Babylon. Um, that is uh, an Aramaic uh, rendering of Babel. Anyways, <clears throat> so he believes that it changed again in, in Babel and that when they came back as as Ezra or or Esdras in Greek, um, sort of standardized it in a sense like the Masoretes did. Now, this is another one of those old wives' tales that doesn't actually have proof in the Bible. Uh, it's never even said that Ezra changed anything. In fact, Ezra was was very much a proponent of keeping the law and the language and the people pure, as was Nehemiah, his associate and contemporary. But he does say 
Furthermore, Ezra's or Ezra did not act alone in this matter. The anathema which he had hurled against the Samaritans having been approved by the doctors of Babylon, he convoked them and held them with that great synagogue so famous in the books of the rabbis. It was there that the changing of the characters was arrested, that the vowel points were admitted in the writing for the use of the vulgar, and the ancient Mazora began, which one should guard yes. against confusing with the modern Mazora, a work of the rabbis of Tiberius, the origin of which does not go back beyond the 5th century of the Christian era. Now, I did write in my notes, and he does have an extensive footnote on that too, I write in my notes all rabbinic nonsense. The perversions would have been called out by Jesus himself, as no points are needed unless the form had been changed. Any change to the word, which the Mazora is or would have been if there would have been a different Mazora in Ezra's time, would be seen with the greatest contempt by a scribe. Funny that even today many Christians reject even the Apocrypha on the basis of it not being in the original holy tongue, yet they'll accept a New Testament in Koine and an Old Testament in Rabbinic Masoretic. As the only there. note that I wrote. What, what do you have to, to say? So I took page 30. And I don't have a note again until page 36 for this very reason. Okay. And 36 is where uh, the sefer just bugged me so much that I had to write a note. The, the word sefer, sephira, mm -hmm. sephiroth, it's a Kabbalistic word. It is mm -hmm. an occult, esoteric word. Clever. The Hebrew root is, is sapar. And, uh -huh. and it actually sapar. But sapars... he chose in this time knowing that he was going to be making a point and he still chose yeah. to call it Sefer. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's an Easter egg, but I now, wrote. Sapar actually, I, I did want to, to uh -huh. mention this cause I'm glad you brought that up. The Sapar being made up of, of three glyphs, it would be the S pet and air. Um, actually, when you look at those three, what it probably meant was literally a roll of parchment because the S um, in its first position would denote something curving uh, and the par having so much to do with animals, young animals, and it's where we probably get our parchment from. But I just did, did really wanted to put that in there. <laughs> was that what, what <laughs> sapar, it is an obri word, but that's probably what it meant was a roll. And sometimes we see that actually being translated as a roll, but that's probably what it was. Actually, okay. that, that was probably more common than books. And I think roles are probably in a lot of ways better uh, than books as far as storage reading. I know some of them, the, the great big ones you need, like it looks like you need two people to kind of do it and all. But I don't really see a yeah. problem with them. I don't see roles as actually or scrolls being, a, uh, you know, antiquated technology maybe like they do today. But uh, sorry, please continue. No, easy to make, easy to keep. Um so what I had written as I got to page 36, um, his case for the authenticity of this work is by merit of Ezra and the factioning around him. But as I read his accounting of, um, of this division between Samaria and Jerusalem, it just sounds like he is saying Byzantium and Constantinople. And I couldn't get that idea out of my mind. Mm -hmm. It sounds, I mean, I've heard a rant like this before. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it sounded like. But I, I did type, I don't have enough knowledge to rebut nor to support his argument. And, the, and, yeah. and that's it. This is where me mentioning that in a biblical sense, uh, scholarly sense in the biblical term, I am a neophyte and it's going to take so much time that I hope that by the end of my investment, I hadn't invested on a moot argument. 
It could be a time suck, but it interested me enough that I do have to look into it. Yeah. Well, okay. So real quickly. Um, also, I'm just I agree. Gonna go through- Jesus didn't have a problem with any of that stuff. And here we come right. across the first lie in the first Mazora. We're going to fix it the way it used to be. So we're going to change it. I thought it was arrested. No, it, it's the first marked standardization <laughs> change. It, you know, if, if it, yeah, if it were, and it, it's the first one in his mind. Um, when you consider, here's the, 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 the thing too. If anybody wants to just read the last chapter of Nehemiah and see not only how he treats uh, Levites that were marrying other women, non-Israelite women, um, how he was horrified that their children didn't even know the language of their fathers, their own language. Um, see how Ezra read the law to the people in chapter 9, I think. Um, these were purists. These weren't people who would have added not even marks to the text. Absolutely not. Uh, So here's the thing about the Samaritans um, and the the people who came back with Ezra and Nehemiah. So before, when it was a northern empire of Israelites and a southern empire of Judahites, there were some tensions. They did fight a lot, in fact. Um, but what happened was, so the king of Asher, he brings in, um, and this is, uh, nah, about a century before they end up going to Babel, Babel for 70 years. He brings in all these various people, uh, including, um, Saparuim, which are our modern Sephardics <clears throat> and, uh, those from Babel, those from Hamat and so on and so forth. And when they're gone in Babel, there's only really a skeleton crew left to keep the vineyards and various portions of land and so on and so forth. But there are a lot of places that are left desolate, especially Jerusalem, because the king of Babel wanted to make an example out of them. So during the time that they're gone, there's uh, a, a number of people that are moving into the land, of course, because there's nobody to stop them. And it was a really good land because it wasn't southern Palestine. And um, so these people called the Orabim, these plains people, they move in quite a bit. The Adumi or Edomites, they move in quite a bit. And for a hundred or so years before that, all of these people that Asher had moved in, these foreign people, they started getting killed by wild beasts all the time. And everybody knew the reason was is because they weren't keeping the laws of Yahweh in his land. And he wasn't going to have that. And so they said, well, what has to happen is the king of Asher has to get somebody, a Luim or Levites, to come and teach them the law. This is basically the source of the Samaritan Pentateuch. This is where people believe it comes from. Now, the only Samaritan Pentateuch we have, is it original? Is it accurate? I don't know. But that, but that's the source, okay, of where that's supposed to have come from. So What happens is in time, these people start believing that they are just as much the equivalent kind of covenantal people as those few tribes that Yahweh chose to preserve in the physical land of Judah until the Messiah came, because he had to preserve them because of a promise he made to David that a king of his line or lineage would always sit on his throne. So when they come back with Ezra and Nehemiah, those people who had been living there for all that time, they approach them and they tell them that way they want to build the temple with them. And it is actually uh, the governor who is a direct descendant of the kings of Judah. His name is uh, Zerubbabel. He's the one that tells them, uh, no, it's not for you to build with us. It's only for us to build. We've been charged with this task. Now, he doesn't say because you're uh, less than us or because, you know, we hate 
whatever and used a uh, uh, an epithet or, or bad term or anything. This is just the fact that they knew because they were descendants of Israel and that Yahweh had made a covenant with them alone that there were certain things that was only for them to do. This made them very unique. Now, some people among the Israelites or Judahites were very well, let's say racist in the sense of believing themselves to be better than other people. Elitist. But there were a number of them that they didn't see it as that. They saw it as we have a covenant with the Almighty. Um, and so we have certain duties and responsibilities as this people. That's the way they saw it. That's certainly how Zerubbabel uh, related to these people who are called the Samaritans eventually. Okay. Um, and that, that's what caused this feud what, on page 36, I had actually highlighted the very middle of the page when he says it is well known. However, little one may reflect that considering the condition of things, the Samaritans, mortal enemies of the Judahites, not Jews, anathematized by Esdras would never have received a book of which Esdras had been the author. And I put in my notes, because I don't remember everything I annotated, but I put in there a clever lie, not taking into account Ezra 4, 1 through 6, the jealousy of the Shomrani or Samaritans, the foreigners. Um, and they were, they were very jealous. Once Zerubbabel told them they couldn't build the temple with them, they caused a ton of trouble with them until there was actually a new king of Paris that took the throne. Uh, these are they who blended all manner of disgusting practice with the Torah, which is today the Talmud or Kabbalah. Um, now, the the thing is, a lot of this white text that I didn't highlight, I don't necessarily remember, nor do I remember everything I highlighted and why. Uh, however, when we are done with this series, I can publish um, both copies of our PDFs that, because I save mine, the annotated PDF as I go. Um, I'm assuming you do too. I, I just... actually have a separate note notation system. I will have to transpose that, but I like okay. your idea. I can I can publish these these annotated um, versions by us on on the website when we're finished with this. So that anybody who's either coming across this later on down the road or that just want to to thumb through it, because it, it is going to get very, uh, very, very particular to those who are actually studying the language end of this when we get into language sections. And it's probably going to be more and more heavily annotated uh, as we get into those portions. Um, now, I know at this point in time, we're already just a couple of minutes shy of two hours. So I did want to hit, uh, you know, just the bit that we can hit um, in chapter three, uh, any particular strong points that he tries to make or you think he does make within chapter three or uh, section three. So let's see what I've got here. Goodness, now, he does, he does spend direction. some time. He does spend some time again on the, the Septuagint. Um, I think it's, it's very, very funny that, um, he, well, he says on this point, um, on page 41, again, we're, we're talking about the, uh, the, the Septuagint and this ideal of Tol Ptolemy wanting a copy for his library and the mythology behind this 72 elders and their perfect translations, which again, every time I hear that story, I think of the King James and the mythos behind the King James version of the Bible. He says on page 41, I cannot conceive by what spirit of contradiction the modern thinkers insist that in the course of circumstances such as I have just presented, Ptolemy did not have the thought that has been attributed to him of making a translation of the Sefer in order to place it in his library. Nothing seems to me so simple. The historian Josephus is assuredly believable on this point, 
as well as the author of the letter of Aristius, notwithstanding certain embellishments with which he loads this historic fact. <laughs> and I put I put in my footnotes, I'm sorry, I put in my footnotes from Rabbi D'Olivet. Because <laughs> so, um, I, I just think that it's real BS. Um, uh, I, I don't trust a thing about Josephus. I don't even trust that there was a guy named Josephus. That's, you know. This actually bugged me so much, this third section, um, because it falls into some of the things that I've looked at um, in my own right, just in the uh, revisionist history portion. And when he, when he speaks of the fall of Rome on page 46 and... everything surrounding it. I just, I'm going to curse. I'm going to curse on this show. It's complete bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's because we know more now and we didn't know more then, or because that is when the current narrative we have was constructed. And mm -hmm. we do know that he comes from a very sensitive time. Uh, in history when there was a heavy rebuilding of a lot of our narratives. Mm -hmm. In fact, they, they restructured all uh, conceptual thought of history during his life. Mm -hmm. and, and so the section as a whole felt like garbage. Yeah. I just... It Everyone mm -hmm. who's listening, read read the third section and tell me if you can find merit in it, especially when he gets on to historical representation, his causes and, and his events are garbled. Neither the Jews nor the Christians were en able to enter into the profoundness of these plans mm -hmm. when he talks about Romans falling to the barbarians. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, it's a lot of pomp and circumstance. It's a lot of theater for things that we know today are complete shit. Yeah, it's it's junk. <clears throat> the whole thing. Um, it is. Well, let's it, see. It made me question his other claims. Mm -hmm. and, and on the second reading, um, look at it with far more scrutiny than the first. Mm-hmm. Um, in the state in the state of ignorance that the Jews were in at the time, this book was thus disguised, or uh, sorry, d thus disguised suited them. He, what he, uh, what he tends to do in this section is, um, I want to make sure I can probably say this right, um, is again, he's making it seem. Oh. All right. It, it, here's a, a good example. This is this is um I, I gotta start from somewhere on this. Because if I jump in right in the middle, um it's it's gonna be problematic. Um in a way, he makes a case for the Jews as they are today. First off, that is reinforced that the Jews of today were the Judahites of even Jesus' day. And there's, first off, there's no proof of that through lineage or anything else. Um, secondly, there's no proof of that in action or behaviors. Thirdly, there's no proof of that in, 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 uh, in, in any prophetic fulfillment because these people hate the Bible. They only give it lip service. That's it. Anybody who has spent enough time either around Jews or reading any Jewish literature or just looking at their actions in general knows that as a fact. Um, however, th this is what really undergirds a lot of the, uh, the bad uh, preconceived notions here, wh whether he's perpetrating them consciously or not. I'm not still not absolutely sure by the end of this reading uh, is the fact that the Judahites, even of Jesus day, 
are the Jews of today. You see, here's the thing. The, the Jews have, and, and in Dialovet's day, they did as well, had a reputation for really um, embracing any culture, any language. It didn't bother them. This idea of Jewish purists is something that is a century old, maybe. Um, and even then, if you want to talk about Jewish purists, yet yeah, purists in the sense of worshiping themselves and maybe their Talmud, but, you know, you can't look at the people of today as the Judahites of, of Jesus' day. Those people, specifically the Pharisees, again, were, at, because he doesn't, this is the other thing. Jesus does not condemn them altogether for all of their actions. It is their actions disregarding the law for tradition. Um, in fact, they did a lot of very good and righteous works, and even the scribes, um, as illustrated in certain portions of the Gospels, were very committed and dedicated to keeping the word as it existed at to that point, so at least we're talking about 39 books, uh, although some people think that they condensed them, but that's coming from rabbinic literature, very pure. Um, and he kind of makes it out to be something a little bit different than that. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, he's he's really towing the party line in that way. Because... The, the typical rabbinic wisdom, probably of his day, to our day, is exactly what he's regurgitating here. These, these are rabbinic ideas that he's recycling. He's not saying much new, and it, and it is interesting. I, I don't know if it's just because he's ignorant to some things or not. Um, you know, he does seem, an, on one hand, to blast the Jews and rabbis, uh, but on the other hand, he does repeat their ideas ad nauseum. Yes. At great length. Seems That's like double the thought. funny thing. It's, yeah, maintaining a, a sense of neutrality by by hitting points on both sides, but at this point, and especially in reference to them, having nothing uniquely his that he does say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then he, he does try to say, um, he, he again toes the party line by saying that, that uh, the Septuagint was a real event and that there was an acceptable version produced from that. And that that was the version used by Jesus that and the apostles, disciples, uh, in the New Testament, and uh, goes on further. Uh, let's see, Wh which I don't see why he supports something like that. I mean, he did just quote in the last chapter um, how, for instance, Jerome found all the Greek that existed in his time so corrupted that he used a Hebrew version. Now, again, now I'm not saying that the narrative about Jerome is correct either. I don't even know if a guy named Jerome existed. I don't know if any of these people existed um, because almost all of them that I read, not only the actions of their life, but their theological beliefs seem to simply just be an overlay of those of the reformers, <laughs> you know, so, I, yeah, I don't know if a Jerome existed, but I can tell you this. I have been reading along in my Bible readings with the Latin Vulgate whenever possible. And the Latin Vulgate to me sounds just like a version based on the modern Masoretic text and the Masoretic mind, because there's a mind that goes with any language and Masoretic is not Obery. Is a different mind. That's what you have to see. That's one of the important things about learning the Bible in Obri apart from Masoretic is because you start seeing a mindset that is different in Hebrew than Obri.
There's always a mind that comes along with the language. It's like inevitable yes. baggage. You know, a language is like having a relative come and stay for a long time. They're going to bring baggage. It's inevitable. Yes. That's what happens with a language. It always has a baggage with it. And There's, he, I actually can't wait to talk about this. He, um, he gets into this heavily in grammar chapter one, and I actually wrote so many of my thoughts that they don't count as an annotation. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, it sparked, it sparked quite a bit of, uh, pondering. Uh -huh. Um, but as for, as for that grammar chapter one, should we pick it up next time there? Yeah, that is, um, let's see. Um, the thing is, mm, he, he does, he does use some examples starting in section two of grammar that are actually mm. going to be positive. Um, he, you know, and that that actually is where we start getting into some very positive things and those are things that could possibly extend out a lot but for good reason um i don't know if i want to bite off too much of a chunk because of how much we can really possibly go into um let me see he does the comparative alphabet in the end of or actually beginning with the Hebraic alphabet and comparative alphabet. Why don't we just say, to keep it simple, we'll just go through <clears throat> those few short sections before we get into Hebraic and comparative alphabet. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's good, because there's enough in there to where we're not going to be spending all kinds of time now after this worrying about his philosophies of history and what he believes the uh, epistemology of this language is. I think at this point, we have gone over this enough um, to first off, anybody who's seriously going to take this book and read it, you know, you can make up your own mind. And it, it might be something that's entirely different than what either one of us have, have said. Um, but I can guarantee you that there's a lot of claims that he makes that I believe would either have to be based on ignorance or are shilling. And I, at this point in time, I really don't know which is which after reading that whole introduction, um, because somebody who just has a darkened mind might just be wrong about a lot of things, no matter how smart they might be. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, the answer to your question is, yeah, I, I really do think it would be positive to just go through the entirety of Hebrew grammar, which would actually take us up to page 68. But, um, are there, are there any other remarks about this? Because the only thing I can say about this forward without I mean, just belaboring points that he makes about Jerome and his Hebrew as compared to Greek and the fighting over that and yada, 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 is that a lot of this stuff, I think people would just do good to read and try to make your, to come to your own decisions on this stuff there, you know, there is a certain learning curve. Some people are going to pick up on this faster than others. Some people that this kind of information is really anterior to other things that they're uh, going after. They might not find it as important. They may not grasp it as readily. But I would definitely suggest it's worth the read because it should challenge you. And never read anything just as, as though it it is gospel. You know, challenge it. I mean, even the gospels, I point out how there's problems between them. Um, and... Anything that has problems, it can have problems for multiple reasons. The problems in this book could be because he is a, a shill. They could be because he just believes something that I don't. Um, 
or they could be because he's ignorant of certain things that today we're not. I'm still not sure. Yeah. But definitely. I think it's important to pay attention to these these first three sections before we get into what he's about to do. Yeah. Because I want to know why. I want to be halfway through the book and look at something and and find it strange and be able to reference and remember his reasons for doing what he's doing. And so yeah. in in absorbing his work, I will be more readily equipped to revise anything with with possibly any updates. If I learn that he is engaged in obfuscation uh, purposely anywhere, I'd like to know that ahead of time. So I gave mm-hmm. this I gave this opening portion extra attention. It, it's good that you did too. And that's why it would be good for anybody who is serious concerning the language aspect of, of what I do, or just in general, the language aspect of the Bible. Um, know that he is coming from certain presuppositions. And it's going to be one of the reasons why so often I'm going to say, um, yet yeah, no, I don't agree with his conclusions here, or I don't agree with the fact that he uses this character, or, you know, at least you understand that first off, he believes that it was changed. The, the pure language that they had was changed once in Egypt and then was once again changed in Babel. And then afterwards, an acceptable Greek translation was made, whether he believes the mythos or not behind the letter of Aristeas. And then he does believe that Jesus and the apostles were quoting Greek and citing the Greek Septuagint. Now, all those things should really be known that he believes those things before we move forward. And, you know, the the contrary things I'm going to say should be known too. All of those things that he said I don't agree with. (laughs) So at least you know where I'm coming from, too. You got to know where somebody's coming from, or else you're not going to understand why they might be passing off something as true that may not be true. Exactly. Yeah. So this was valuable. Um, And with that, I guess I, I had better wrap it at 215, which is still pretty good for all of that material. My goodness, we could have went on for days on all of that. But oh, it, yeah. it really would have distracted us from the main thrust of, of what we're doing here. And I think we've definitely um, touched on all of the more important points. Uh, we definitely did not get anywhere near into all of his uh, claims, whether they be fantastical or, or subtle. And again, that's why the books in the description, anybody please read it because it, it is valuable just in the sense that I hope it challenges everybody who reads it to fact check. So unless you have anything more to add, Nathan, just that we're here to learn. That's the purpose of this. Absolutely. So if anybody is interested in a dialogue or a conversation, you can always reach us here at the comments section, our respective groups, emails. Doesn't matter. I'd, I would love to hear from people. I agree. A hundred percent. And um, even though sometimes uh, the tone that I take with certain items I take in a way uh, authoritatively. It's it's simply because in some ways I've seen enough, read enough, done enough of my own work to have a very strong opinion on it. Doesn't mean I'm right about everything. And uh, I've never taken the position of being uh, necessarily a teacher who's right about everything. I'm learning as much as everybody else out there is about all of these things. So um, please feel free to dialogue with us. Uh, And until next time, where we'll be going from the Hebrew grammar portion, which takes us up to page 68 in the book, Um, we'll see you then. (music) 